Uh, the first study we looked at again, just to recap briefly, was the first creation Eden and the Garden of Eden uh, that became a wilderness, of course, that will now be restored. The second study we looked at uh, the great earthquake that reinstates the Garden of Yahweh in the middle of the earth. And tonight, brothers and sisters, we want to look at aspects of the land, aspects of life as revealed in the prophets. Uh, Eden restored the land promised to Abraham. This area of Eden, which is the nucleus uh, of the recovery of the earth as to Christ's return. And uh, I want us to lift ourselves, if we can, brothers and sisters, out of 2024 here in Adelaide, where we're listening to this talk, unless you're online and maybe uh, elsewhere. Um, but we want to lift ourselves out of this life and imagine ourselves in the kingdom of God at this particular time. We've got to remember that millions of people will be recovering from the destruction, the horror and the catastrophe of that devastating earthquake spoken of in Isaiah 2 and Isaiah 24. And what will remain we, um, will be elements of life that will be so incredibly different for the mortals. And it will be very different, of course, for us as saints in that age, in the age to come. And so we want to explore some features, these little snapshots and little insights and glimmers into the future that we see throughout the prophets um, here tonight. And uh, as you can see, um, hopefully it will come across that I really love this, this topic, brothers and sisters. And I really love it because um, you love it and we can see ourselves there. As we said, uh, here's just a sketch of what this particular Arabian Peninsula may or may not look like, the area of Eden in the future, split by rivers, um, fed by that incredible source of life from Mount Zion with its source beneath the ground coming out of Mount Zion, spilling into the Jordan Valley and then heading through the glorious area, splitting off and symbolising, of course, the wonderful source of life that is ruling in Zion. And that river system that goes into the Arabian Peninsula serves a dual purpose. The first purpose is literal, and that is to feed and water a spectacular landscape, lush forest, trees, flowers, parks, gardens, manicured uh, lawns even, that we can imagine being there as a space for the saints and a space that is attracting uh, people from all over the world that are hearing about this, recovering in that post-Armageddon phase of, uh, of the world. But it's also serving a purpose, this water of life, to demonstrate the source of that life is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, he is the source of blessing. He is the source of healing. He is the source of forgiveness and the source of light that will attract pilgrims to come up to Jerusalem uh, at this particular time. So again, this hasn't been an event subsequent. We're not looking at the time periods here, but it is important, brothers and sisters, to imagine the world still in a period of chaos. And we can perhaps um, put this period of time into that first 50 years after the Lord Jesus Christ has stood on the Mount of Olives and this particular peninsula has burst into life as the nucleus and beginning of the kingdom of God, this place of repose and fellowship. And those nations, as we know, that will first convert will be such as those such as um, Egypt, who have been smitten and healing and who are watching people um, traverse the great highway towards Zion. Now, I, I, I love talking about this topic, too, because... I've got some great points from you and sharing some of them um, initially uh, that I've received, just a couple of little um, great little points. Brother Grant said to me, he suggested that Jerusalem at this particular time could be higher even than Mount Hermon because as Toby read for us in the prophecy of Micah, Zion is established in the top of the mountains and the mountain range that goes all the way through uh, up to Hermon um, may suggest that Jerusalem is very elevated through the work of God in the earthquake. Brother Roger Gore said to me that um, 
you know, with the destruction of, uh, of many, the slain of Yahweh shall be many. It's the slain of Yahweh. It's not indiscriminate necessarily. It, um, even though we suspect the population, and if we take Israel as a template to what will happen with the nations, two thirds of the Jews will be destroyed and one third survive. What if that template is replicated with the globe and we've got eight or nine billion people at that time? Think, do the maths, two or three billion left if that, and the destruction will be not indiscriminate though. Yahweh is in control, even down to the particular individuals that uh, pass off the scene at that time. Brother Russell Lee mentioned the salt marshes around Zion. Why would they be there? Yes, to collect salt, of course, for the, um, for the sacrifices up in Zion, but to remind a spiritual principle that we, brothers and sisters, are the salt of the earth. We've been the salt of the earth. That's why we'll be there in that day. Because salt, it influences and it has a great um, influence of those around them. And we're in an environment today, brothers and sisters, of corruption. And salt stops and halts corruption. Um, I think Brother Grant also told me that river, and I probably should have mentioned that, that comes out of Zion, um, goes north, northwards as well as southwards, and finds its way eventually into the Mediterranean Sea. Um, brother, uh, Sister Glenis, actually, speaking of salt marshes, um, Sister Glenis over there um, mentioned Ezekiel 38 about every wall shall fall to the ground. That the power of that earthquake and the change in that time will not leave any um, infrastructure standing. And we've got to consider that when we talk, when we think about what is left in the environment around us. And even um, my, my wife said to me, you know, suggested that the um, survivors of that earthquake in the time to come are likely to be in the rural communities because 85% in some countries of the population are urbanised in cities and 60% um, in others. So it is highly likely that the survivors of the great earthquake are likely to be rural, which means also they're poor. And so it is the slain of Yahweh. So the wealthy who have accumulated riches in the cities are probably likely to suffer the strongest uh, element of God's rod in that day. So, you know, I, I couldn't help but think as we um, uh, went through the readings, let's just look at, we've been reading Isaiah in the last few days, and, you know, again, just to see um, this principle of rivers everywhere. And the water of life is a beautiful theme through Isaiah. Um, for example, uh, chapter 41, um, a couple of days ago. When the poor and needy, we've just spoken about them, perhaps the majority of survivors, when the poor and needy seek water, there is none and their tongue faileth. I, Yahweh, will hear them. The God of Israel will not forsake them. I'll open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of valleys. I'll make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. So rivers throughout the, uh, the area of the Middle East that no doubt um, will have sprung up all over the world. Yes, in a period of chaos out there, but particularly here. I'll plant in the wilderness, verse 19, again, the beautiful thing about these prophecies, brothers and sisters, they have a literal application, but also a spiritual and metaphorical one. I'll plant in the wilderness cedar, the shitter tree, the myrtle, the oil tree. I'll set in the desert the fir tree, the pine and the box tree together. What a beautiful picture of a variety of amazing um, of trees that represent you and I. In all of our life-giving ability, the, the, the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations. We must see ourselves there, brethren and sisters, and here represented by those beautiful trees. Chapter, 40, uh, chapter 43, verse 19 of Isaiah. Behold, I'll do a new thing, a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I'll make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Again in verse 20. I'll give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Ver chapter 44, verse 3. I'll pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. 
Today, brothers and sisters, Eden is barren. It is a desert. All the way through Arabia will spring up with water in the desert. Now, it sounds like, brothers and sisters, I'm going over old ground here, but I really want to emphasize this principle in context of, again, our Joshua readings recently as well, our studies by Brother Jamin, because we know of this area that was promised to Abraham, why was it that the promises, it reads as though in Joshua, that when Joshua went across the Jordan and inherited the land, the promises to Abraham were fulfilled in that sense, primarily fulfilled. Why is it that, th that the land actually promised to Abraham is a lot bigger than that? And yet the language in Joshua is when they came into the land is here it is, the promised land. And there's a very important reason why, and I think I just want to touch on it in one simple chapter, and it's this reason in Isaiah chapter 54. So have a quick look at this. It, the, the land promised to Abraham is larger than what Joshua um, went in, um, who obviously represents Christ, but in the first advent, the truth just went to the Jews. It went to, the gospel was preached just to the Jews initially. And the beautiful expansion of the promises to Abraham um, includes the Gentiles. And that's the principle here. Isaiah 54 verse 2, this time an allegory about camping. And here in verse 2, the, the prophet says, well, verse 1, sing, O barren, this is a beautiful, um, a beautiful message Break forth into singing. There's a lot of joy here. Um, for the children of the desolate are more than the children of the married, saith Yahweh. There is hope for us, brothers and sisters, as Gentiles. Enlarge the place of thy tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitation. Spare not. So the Jewish tent, what we're told here is that God is saying, no, no, no. It's not just going to accommodate you Jews and you Israelites. Get the tent pegs, stretch them right out. Expand this tent. This is a marquee. This is going to go to the Euphrates. It's going to go all the way to the river of Egypt. The Gentiles are coming. They're coming in the future. And they're going to be in the tent that belongs to the promises to Abraham. Expand it. And that's what Isaiah is doing here. Because he says in verse 3, after saying, strengthen your stakes. This is big. For you shall break forth on the right hand and on the left. You'll expand everywhere and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. And so this is the nucleus of the kingdom of God that will attract in the initial part the Gentiles before, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints start the military campaigns to conquer the world. And conquering of the world will definitely um, go on. Now, that's the introduction. What we're going to do now is um, have a look at in the kingdom. What is going to happen here and spread out from here is the nucleus. There will be God-centered travel. Things will change. Pilgrimages to Zion to worship the king. God-centered. God-centered farming. And we're going to see coming out the principle of trust is going to be engendered in uh, the occupants of the world, the survivors of the world that change their lifestyles. God-centered industry. There will be building and there will be in industry, uh, manufacturing and industry in the kingdom, but it will be God-centered. There'll be a new climate. Um, there'll be a completely different climate, 24-hour light in, the, in this particular part of God's kingdom uh, that we're talking about here. Even God's principle seen in the animal creation, completely different to what it is now. And of course, long life for the mortals as well. Genetic reversal uh, of the curse. And so let's go through a couple of these really interesting little aspects to think about, to make you think about them. And they might not be exactly as I'm uh, suggesting or interpreting per se, but we must consider the scriptural verses and think about them in reality. Now, the first one is, again, these are not complicated verses, very familiar to most of us. All nations shall flow unto Zion. That's in Micah 4, our reading, and in Isaiah chapter 2. 
And we're told there in, in the end of verse 2, I say, in Isaiah 2, that in the last days the mountain of Yahweh's house should be established in the top of the mountain, this kingdom period, first 50 years, and all nations will flow unto it. And that word flow, brothers and sisters, is the Hebrew naha, which means to sparkle and dance and to be radiant and joyful. And it's interesting that this metaphor has going up to the mountain of the Lord, flowing up. And it's almost unnatural because water flows downwards with gravity, but they're attracted to the kingdom of God. This is not natural. What is happening here? is a flow that is not natural, but it's joyful. It is so joyful. And people are sparkling and dancing like the little sparkle drops on top of a beautiful crystal clear river. One of these rivers in Eden. And people are like that. And they're flowing together to the goodness of Yahweh, who is in Zion. Isaiah 33 is an interesting one here because, again, it's one of those puzzling little um, insights into the kingdom. Isaiah chapter 33, verse 21. It's in the context of this land being split by rivers. And it talks about Zion in verse 20, um, a quiet habitation. It's a dwelling place. Um, interestingly enough, a beautiful connection to Isaiah 54, because it talks about it's a tabernacle that won't be taken down. This is a tent, the tabernacle the true dwelling place of God with man in his son, not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed, neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. That's telling us to think about that Isaiah 54. But there, in this place, the glorious Yahweh will be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams, wherein shall go no galley with oars, neither shall gallant ship pass thereby. That's interesting. Why would it say there's no galleys that go on these rivers and no gallant ship, no majestic ship? I'm suggesting, brothers and sisters, that galley oars are man-powered. It's giving honour and glory to the strength of man. Gallant ships in the ESV is majestic ships, big P&O cruisers that give glory to man and pleasure craft in that sense. Not here. So perhaps there is... Boats that trans transport, assist, transport the thousands of survivors up and down these rivers towards Zion. And they're God-powered because the rivers are running to Zion as well as out of Zion. Because we know that because we looked last time at the that Yahweh will strike the Euphrates into seven streams. And so there will be there's a reason for that. And perhaps the reason for that is transporting through the power of God's flow through there. And I can imagine, brothers and sisters, I don't know, this is my speculation, but I can imagine the saints, us here, loading those people into the boats and talking about, you're going to sparkle along. You're going to be so joyful. We'll tell you about um, Noah and he was saved by water and he was in an ark and they were together and there'd be this kind of conversation that you will have because you'll be talking to the mortals in that particular time. And perhaps travel in that sense is motivated um, and, and, and used. The water is used in that way. Not exclusively, because we know God can move people um, by the Spirit instantly. We might have to do that. Acts 8 verse 39 is the example of um, Philip, who was talking to the Ethiopian eunuch and was suddenly snatched away, and Philip later was found in Azotus. So the Spirit can move like that as well. First of Thessalonians 4 is another one to look up there because when we are taken, brothers and sisters, we are taken instantly by the power of God. It's that same Greek word, hapazo, snatched away suddenly. So travel could be all sorts of these different options. With the mortals, I suspect it's slowly. And we'll get to that. And I think that's a really important point, brothers and sisters, because, you know, today, if we look at uh, quotes like Amos chapter 8, don't turn it up. Or even Daniel. Let's think about Daniel first. Today, what is it? Rushing around. Many shall run to and fro. Knowledge shall be increased. Our travel is fast. 
It's engineered by man, the power of man. It's planes, it's cars, it's very, very fast. And the language of the scriptures is that every man shall walk in God's ways. We will slow down. The mortals will be caused to slow right down. To think about the principles of the word. To absorb the principles of God's truth. And to take them into their hearts and to meditate again. We go, go, go. Amos chapter 8 says that. People run to and fro trying to seek the word of God and they wander around. They can never find it. Always in a hurry. One of the things about the kingdom of God is God gives long life to the mortals that we'll come back to in a minute. As we said, God-centered energy sources. Look, I don't know, but the water, the rivers that are flowing to create energy and solar, obviously the sun, the light, and of course the spirit. Who knows, brothers and sisters, um, in which way these um, wonderful blessings, natural blessings that we will experience and see the mortals experience in the kingdom of God will be used. I want us to sense the excitement, brothers and sisters, of those survivors, because you imagine when the undescribable catastrophe happens that there'll be survivors who will turn around and they will, there will still be survivors with the ability to fight wars. So there will be some uh, infrastructure that remains that does survive somehow. And there'll be some that say, this was a natural disaster. And there'll be many that say, I don't think it was a natural disaster. I have heard that Jesus Christ is behind this, that he is alive. I've heard it's, a, it's all about Israel. I've heard that there's been something like divine intervention. There's this glow over the Middle East. There doesn't, there's, there's stories about no sun going down. And people will say, we want to go there. We want to be part of this, understand why there is starting to be lush green growth and trees that are shooting up unnaturally quickly in that area. Why is this? Let us go up to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For we're hearing that out of Zion is going the law and we've heard about the word of Yahweh that's coming from Jerusalem. So, brothers and sisters, the, the physical climate and the literal basis of the kingdom of God will be something incredibly remarkable. And this will flow on to God-centered agriculture and a way of life gradually, globally, as these individual mortals in the kingdom end up traveling back, taking with them the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem to their homelands. Whether they travel through the in the rafts or the boats or the rivers or whether they're on the dromedaries and camels and however they end up getting there or whether it is through the power of the spirit assisted by the saints, they will take those laws back and their climate and their agricultural lifestyle will be blessed. And they shall sit every man, ultimately, after a period of time, whether it is 50 years, 100 years, or even 150 years, eventually, this spreads out globally. But I want to highlight a couple of features, brothers and sisters, that characterise our earth now, that are so opposite this and are very likely to change in the kingdom of God because it can't be like that as it is now and what the scriptures talk about is 
God says a couple of fundamental doctrines that you and I espouse. This one is one in particular. I created the earth not in vain. I formed it to be inhabited. Inhabited. The earth. As truly as I live, all the earth. Not some of it. Not half of it. Not 9% of it or 3%. All the earth will be filled with the glory of Yahweh. It must change as a result of the earthquake. So only 27% of the globe is even land today. 73% is ocean as it stands now. I don't think it's going to stay like that after the twisting and catastrophic events of Isaiah 24. Interestingly, only 1% of the Earth's surface is covered at the moment by man's infrastructure. That surprised me when I researched that. That's a very small amount, really. But of the 20% of land, 27% of land that fills the globe, a third of that land is uninhabitable. It's rock, it's ice, it's glacier, it's desert. That, to me, is not fill, isn't, the earth is not filled with God's glory. Creative power, yes. But it's not maximising the glory of God that he has ready for us. 9% is to the forest, grassland and shrub. The other 9% or a third of the land is actually taken up at the moment with agriculture. 6%, half, two thirds of it, 6% livestock, feedlots and cattle and so on, and 3% cropping. And it is why we have ended up in a highly industrialised technical te te and, and farming technology has had to systemise the production of food for the population that has now outgrown the earth in terms of how it can um, survive because, as we said, most of that 1% of the earth's surface covered by man's infrastructure is in cities. And so man does not survive today on micro-subsistent farming. So we have a problem, brothers and sisters, with the world now versus what God says every man will sit under their vine and fig tree. And that's not just a, a, a happy metaphor. I think that is literal, that the mortal population in the future will all be that way. Another way of describing that diagrammatically um, is 29% of the globe is land, 71% is habitable, 46% is agriculture, and two thirds of that is, is um, like I said, is feedlots and, and cattle. One third is um, cropping, and it is interesting, if you're interested in this type of thing, that the one third of the uh, habitable agricultural land of the world um, provides about three quarters of the protein and the calories for people. So it's far more efficient. That is one thing about this. It is far more efficient to um, provide cropping because of the legumes and all of the, of the wheat and the barley and so on that provide um, far more efficiently than um, beef and cattle and lamb production, for example. Another way of illustrating this, you can see um, some sort of uh, representation there of the area of the world at the moment that is dedicated to the only area to what you could particularly say would be every man under his vine and fig tree um, habitable cropping equivalent space in, uh, across the globe. Uh, focusing in there on Australia, you can see the wheat belt around WA and, and uh, the, the southeast of Australia. That doesn't include the the area, um, a lot of areas around uh, cattle farming, but the obvious area of uh, gap you can see in the globe today is uh, the sub-Saharan Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, which forms the nucleus of the kingdom of God, especially coming between the Euphrates and the Red Sea, uh, or the Nile, should I say, not the Red Sea, and that other um, very high mountainous area that continue through the Himalayas to the right-hand side, let alone, as we said, the great windswept freezing cold plateaus of um, areas like East and West Siberia. Um, another description of how this looks, if you were to actually apply it to the globe itself and see what percentages of land are dedicated to, um, to cropland and so on. There's not much fresh water on the earth. 1% of the earth's land is fresh water. That's going to change in the kingdom of God with the rivers. 1% um, built up area, mostly destroyed in Armageddon and uh, the, the, the earthquakes. 
Um, and of course, um, barren areas, barren lands, especially um, re, uh, revegetated as soil inundation, no doubt, covers a lot of these barren areas after the earthquake. So ha what happened in order to um, maximize, where, where, did, where did the world go wrong? And, and how did they have to maximize the limited resources that are on this globe? And again, without making this too negative, um, it was really th only 200 years ago, 250 probably years ago at the most, when the Industrial Revolution happened. And before that, there was subsistence farming, there was artisan uh, industries, cottage industries, if you like, where people made their own clothes, they uh, built their own cupboards, they uh, um, planted their own um, vegetables and, and so on. But what happened was mankind became uh, greedy through capitalism and systemized uh, and aggregated those cottage industries to create mass production systems based on dollars, creating uh, wealth and efficiency, and then gathering the poor and the working class into cities. And of course, that meant then that population explosion happened in the last 250 years from a billion uh, in 1800, doubled in, a, in about 100 years to 2 billion. And in the next 100 years, from 1920 to 2020, went from 2 billion to 8 billion. So the world is in trouble trying to feed itself and survive. And as a result, the social evils came along um, that were associated with cities and the working class, the rich and the poor spread apart. And of course, one of the uptakes of technology was of course, military technology enabling the systematic murder and destruction of humanity to occur as a result. Not pleasant reading in a history of the Industrial Revolution in about two or three minutes. That's a summary of man. That's the problem that the Lord Jesus Christ has had enough of and will, um, will need to uh, address. And of course, the, destruct, the most destructive of these industries are listed there on, on the, the top that either have to become extinct or become shifting to become God glorifying. The energy industry, as we know, pumping smoke and, and so on into the atmosphere. Energy will be in the kingdom of God, as we said. It will be water, it will be the spirit, it will be solar, God-centered solutions. Transport, agriculture, we'll look at in a little bit more detail now. And we look at food retail, which is associated with agriculture. And of course, the fashion industry. Can you believe it is the fifth most polluting industry in the world? The fashion industry is completely extraordinary. And that one will be probably in the extinct category in, the t in terms of even the richest man in the world is the owner of the luxury houses of Louis Vuitton and LMVH and the luxury handbags and leather goods that are exported out of France are more than their camembert cheese and their food and their wine. That is ridiculous. And the reason for that, brothers and sisters, is because people Human nature, the flesh, has to show and demonstrate its symbols of power somehow. And if you don't own a big piece of land and you live in an apartment in Hong Kong or Shanghai or Paris or New York, all you can do is buy an expensive watch or a pen or a jumper or a necklace. And you're keeping these sorts of industries um, are uh, going. They will go. So what does the kingdom of God promise us, brothers and sisters? This is a beautiful quote in Amos chapter 9. And this is, the days are coming, says the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper. That's a beautiful expression. It's, a, it's an expression, and, and the treader of grapes who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip, drip sweet wine. So when God's earthquake reshapes the planet, and the soils move around and create the space for subsistence farming and micro farming and cottage industry all around the world for the mortals to take place, God will bless those who have been to Zion. And why will he do that? Do you know why they will do that, brothers and sisters? Because they will have read the Bible. 
And they will have read the world's first environmental legislation because the world's first environmental legislation is back in the book of, of uh, Leviticus. How to manage a farm, how to manage your crops. And I want us to turn, brothers and sisters, to uh, Leviticus 25 because I believe that the systems of farming under the law will be re-established in the kingdom. And in Leviticus 25, this is so wonderful because this was the seven-year farming cycle that God said, if you do this and trust in me, you'll be blessed. And Jesus and all of us, brothers and sisters, we have to learn this because we'll be telling the mortals about this to go back to their land and their farms and to do this. He says in verse 19 and 20, or say verse 19, every seven years, you've got to let your land go fallow. You've got to leave it alone. In chapter 25, verse 19, the land shall yield her fruit and you shall eat your fill and dwell therein safely. You'll dwell safely. There's Amos, there's Micah, there's Isaiah. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year? Because they weren't allowed to um, do any reaping or any sowing. And verse 21, God says, I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year. And it shall bring forth fruit for three years. And you'll sow the eighth year and eat of the old fruit until the ninth year until her fruits come in, you shall eat of the old store. So God said, you listen to me. You let the soil do its thing. I don't want you to plough it. I don't want you to prune your um, fruit trees. I don't want you to prune your grapes. I don't even want you to pick anything or have a harvest in that seventh year. It's a Sabbath to me, and I want the ground to rest. And I want it to lie fallow. And yes, it'll grow and it'll look all crazy and there'll be fruit dropping off and getting rotten. And that's a good thing. You know why it's a good thing? Because Exodus also, chapter 23, it's there at the bottom, says this. You've got to leave it, that land, even if it's your farm, your little farm, you've got to let the poor turn up and they can take any food they want on the seventh, on the seventh year. You've got to be generous. Because I'm generous, says God. And the, the, the soil itself will heal. Don't worry about this. Keep topping it up with superphosphate every year, hoping you get another yield. Because you see, in the soil, there's these things called soil microbes. And most farmers don't worry about this because we have corporate farming anyway. And a lot of farmers are, um, don't farm just to eat. Even in Australia, a lot of farmers based on the profit motive and they are worried about getting a brand new John Deere tractor or a GPS header or whatever it might be. That's what they're worried about. In the kingdom, it's about the soil and it's about God's land healing every seventh year. Um, there's these little soil microbes in there, little bacteria uh, that are called, um, uh, well, these little microbes and they, are, um, they produce the, the humus in the soil and that soil and the worms and everything else in there are the life of the soil. You can't even see them. So they're not harvested today. Um, they can't be sold um, and they're forgotten about, but they actually store the moisture and they produce up to about 15 tonnes, I read, uh, of nitrogen per hectare in the soil. You don't need superphosphate if you follow these rules that God put in place. And... It looked like this. The cycle of the Sabbath looks something like this. Now, that's a diagram, pretty rough diagram. Just stare at it for a little while. It's, um, it will make sense. It's the seven-year cycle of a farmer in the kingdom and under the law if they did the right thing. So year one, you plow, plow at the beginning of the season, you know, and so four months later, you reap and pick and prune, and the cycle went on. And you get to year six, and you're feeling a bit nervous, but you're trusting God. It's developing trust. Because in year six, you're praying and praying and praying. Guess what God does? He gives you a triple bounty. He gives you three times as much in year six up the top. So instead of reaping, you're reap, reap, reaping. Instead of picking, you're pick, pick, picking. You're, you're loaded with pears and with apples. And you're absolutely, the, the, the plowman overtakes the reaper. 
It's just, you are like Joseph, you're saying, stop counting it, it's too much. In year six, because in se seventh, you've got to let the ground be fallow and let it go. And so from year seven through to year nine, or the first and second on repeat, you're praising God. You're so thankful to God for this abundance in his generosity. So the whole cycle of farming, you're either thanking God or you're praising, praying to him saying, please bless the, the next few years, next, the sixth year in particular. And it's creating this cycle of dependence upon God. And God is saying, hooray, I'm going to send the rain. A little bit like we had at the beginning of the class. I'll send it down. I'll grow the, the, the vegetables for you. And you would be, you'll, you'll be eating them till year nine. And guess what? You were allowed to eat them in year one or year eight because that was the rules. But God's generous. You actually got... Um, twice as much in year one and got, or at the end at, at least and twice as much of some left over in year two. God's very generous. He just doesn't say, oh, look, oh, uh, you just obey me and I'll give you just enough. He's, he's so generous and abundant. And isn't that beautiful? And the other thing that they all do, brothers and sisters, the mortals, when they look at this cycle and they're just so thankful all the time is they go, now that we've got this one command, we've got to go up from year to year to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And they will want to do that. They will want to do that because, you see, they'll come up from every year to, to keep the Feast of Booths and they'll bring all of the um, wonderful uh, plants and offerings and they'll get the leaves, the palm leaves and whatever. And if we have a look back in, for example, Leviticus chapter 23, um, a few pages back, or first of all, um, those of you... Uh, maybe the young people, that quote that I said, that the mortals will go up from year to year to keep the Feast of Tabernacles is in Zechari at the end of Zechariah chapter 14. And it's the Feast of Booths. And the, the, it is recorded for us in Leviticus 23, and we're running out of time, so we won't, um, we won't read this in great detail, uh, except I wanted to note one thing. It's a time of great joy. It's a time of great joy. It's a, it was one of the feasts at, um, that was instituted really at the ingathering of all of your harvest. And it was after you were joyfully blessed, you want to go up and give thanks to God. And not only that, you were to celebrate by taking the boughs of goodly trees, verse 40, and boughs of thick trees and willows of the brook and go and rejoice and camp outside in this little booth made of tree branches and palm leaves. And remember, that's what you did, what Israel did when God took them out of Egypt. In other words, remember, God is your shelter and he dwells with you. And I think it's beautiful, brothers and sisters, if we cast ourselves forward many thousands of years, and there's a Feast of Tabernacles. And the Lord says, I'll come down later. And he comes down at the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. And he says he stands up on the last great day of the feast. And he says, come unto me. I am the source of living water. And let's have a look at that, brothers and sisters. It's so beautiful. He is... The, what this is all leading to, the source of living water. And as you're immortal in the kingdom, you're coming up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles to remember the Lord Jesus Christ and, and worship him. So in John chapter 7, we're told this remarkable thing that Jesus did. He called out. It was the last day of this feast time. And in actual fact, the tradition has it that this... On the last great day, there was um, a number of things, a number of other offerings, including libation, um, where water was poured out. And Jesus stood up, said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And think of the mortals in the kingdom of God. They're coming up there. There's a place of abundant rivers and streams. They might be in a boat. They might be walking through the highway at this point from Assyria to Egypt. And they're thinking about what Jesus said. And they're going to see the king. And he that believeth on me, Jesus cried out, said, 
As the scripture has said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. So you are becoming the source of life. So these people coming from all over the place, from the areas of the east and the west and China and India and all the way to South America and however they get there, whether there are land bridges that have joined by then or whatever, but they're all coming there because they want to, out of their belly, they want to take back the rivers of living water back to their homes, back to their farms. They want to bring the truth that comes from Zion, that comes from the source of life, where that river is coming down from in the future. And they're going to bring that message back to their home. And it comes from Jesus himself. And so let's t turn to Revelation chapter 7. Because in Revelation chapter 7, brothers and sisters, this again, the Lord alludes to this remarkable and awe-inspiring time. In that vision, in uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 uh, to 17. And it's the vision of the Lamb upon Mount Zion. And here we have the theme coming out, jumping out before us of the Feast of Tabernacles. People that have come up rejoicing in their wonderful farm life, giving thanks to God. And you've got immortals here as well in white robes, but they've got palms in their hands. Why? Because it's, it's the Feast of, this is the Feast of Tabernacles. Everyone is rejoicing in the abundance of, of their blessings that have come um, from Christ. And we've got uh, in verse 15, for example, without reading all of this, um, therefore are they before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sits on the throne shall dwell among them, shall tabernacle, that word is in the Greek. Here's the tabernacle, the true tabernacle of God and of not of men. So here's the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the Lord Jesus Christ himself who is dwelling among them. And he shall shelter them with his presence. He dwells among them. They'll dwell in that tabernacle. They will hunger no more, nor thirst. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. And for the Lamb, verse 17, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them. He's the one that feeds them. He's the one, the source of all of their... Uh, wonderful produce and their long lives and their happiness and joy, he'll lead them unto living fountains of waters. This place of abundant water and sorrow is gone. God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. It's a beautiful time, brothers and sisters. It's a time of light. A wonderful God-centered climate and light. Gentiles, we read in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 2, will come to thy light. And there'll be this great glow over Eden, this brighter over Zion itself, always day, a brilliant um, canopy. We'll just look up one of these references in the interest of time in the fourth chapter of Isaiah. And imagine, brothers and sisters, being in this environment with the bird life, the uh, wonderful rivers, the laughter, the joy, uh, the conversations with brethren and sisters, the conversations that you want to have with Moses or Elijah or the prophets who might be there, um, Ruth might be Rahab, and it, it would picture yourself walking around with those tame and harmless animals that may be amongst it. In Isaiah chapter 4, and we'll read in verse 5, and Yahweh will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies, that's the whole area, not just Mount Zion, a cloud and a smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night, for upon all the glory there shall be a covering or a defence, a canopy, a booth. So there's a protection of light and fire and there'll be this tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from heat and a place of refuge and a covert from storm and rain. And you put that passage alongside of chapter 60 of Isaiah and chapter 14, verse 6 of Zechariah, and it would appear that this is always light. It must be, brothers and sisters. I am the light of the world, and he's in the earth at this wonderful time. I'll have to um, uh, push on in the next uh, few minutes. I won't take very long, but maybe we will continue We'll finish this um, on the industry. 
It's an industry based on recycling, brothers and sisters, swords into plowshares. And man shall beat their swords into plowshares. This is happening outside in, in the world at this time. It's a time when uh, mankind will completely crush those, uh, those weapons. It doesn't mean to beat them in the sense that this sculpture is outside the United Nations. It's not a readaption of the defence industry, brothers and sisters. The defence industry is eventually eliminated altogether. How ironic that the, um, uh, that the country, the nation that gave that sculpture to the United Nations was the uh, Soviet Union, of all things. Um, but the Lord Jesus Christ will crush the nations, interestingly as well, with a rod of iron. And Isaiah 39 verse 6 says that there will be potentially a fire for, for seven years as a result of the um, destruction at Armageddon. What could that mean other than potentially a smelting process of the, of the crushed uh, metal um, objects that contribute towards the military technology process? And where all of that is, is repurposed, whether it's a ship, whether it's the cars or whatever, the repurposing and smelting. Now, we know smelting was in the, in the Old Testament because it was one of the promises again under the law, brothers and sisters, that um, they were told, if you obey me, you will find um, metal, a land out of whose hills you'll dig brass and copper will be there by abundance. There were plenty of blacksmiths and there will be in the kingdom coppersmiths, manual labour, they'll build houses and inhabit them. See, brothers and sisters, the Armageddon, um, the, the destruction and the, and the infrastructure that will be, need to be cleaned up and recycled uh, will be immense. It will take years. Masonry will be there, though, for stonemasons to build and re-inhabit and make um, buildings and uh, places uh, to occupy. The steel will be recycled. And it is interesting, isn't it, when you look at something like that mangled pile there, that what is it? Again, in God's poetry, brothers and sisters, iron and clay. When the, the stone comes down upon the iron and clay, yes, we know it, that represents spiritually, but physically, there's going to be a tremendous destruction of iron and clay, concrete and iron reinforcing throughout the earth as a result of um, these things. And of course, brothers and sisters, we might say, well, how's the steel transported? Well, we know the saints can do that. We can do that. But it's there in the Bible. Think of Elisha, a type of Christ returning back. And he's telling the sons of the prophets, I want you to build, you know, this. we haven't got enough room for the sons of the prophets. I need to build something. And someone's building away and wielding an axe. The axe head falls off and drops into the water. And, oh, master, master, where's the axe head gone? He says, well, where is it? And he said, well, I went into the water over there. So what does Elisha do? Grabs a stick, throws it into the water, and the iron floats. How will the steel get around and that kind of thing? The saints will be performing these sorts of miracles um, through Christ, and they will only do it if we say, because well, that's what the stick represents. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. People have to have a faith. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Or throw the stick. That's what it represented. You know, Moses, Mara. So these are the principles all found through the scriptures, brothers and sisters, that give us a little idea about what we will do in the kingdom of God to re-establish the kingdom. God-centered horticulture. Roses, maybe without thorns. Who knows? Um, no more curse. That is the point, brothers and sisters. Instead of thorns will come up the myrtle tree, instead of uh, um, briars will come up the... Um, I, I think I have to look it up. Um, Isaiah 55 and verse um, 17 that says, well, it's actually not even Isaiah 55 verse 17. I've got that wrong. It's verse 13. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. You know, we thought about that too, brothers and sisters. The thorns, the weeds, the thistles, gone. And gradually as these Farmers go back to their plots and their acreage and they're noticing because they're following the agricultural cycle and they're giving praise to God. They've been to Jerusalem. They've, they've been exalted with what um, the Lord Jesus Christ has taught them through the saints. And they go back and there's less thorns and all of a sudden there's more abundance and there's more beauty and they're getting great rains. 
And as a nation, that's happening. If their leaders are, are observing this and are prepared to bow the knee and submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. We only have three or four minutes to go, if you'll bear with me. And so, what about the animal creation, brothers and sisters? The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard lie down with the kid and a little child shall lead them. You know, children, you've got to see yourself in the kingdom with God having changed the nature and the violent nature of animals. This is very literal. But with the literal, brothers and sisters, of course, there's the spiritual. There's the metaphor as well that goes with this. Who's the little child that shall lead the nations that were once violent, like the animals? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll lead them. And it's the wolf that comes to dwell with the lamb. And it's the leopard that lies down. They're the ones that learn. It's the nations, brothers and sisters, who have been made tame by Christ. Of course this will happen, literally. We have all these hints through the Bible, don't we? Like, God's done it before. Daniel was in a lion's den, now tame. Why can't he do it again? Why won't he do it again? In our Lord Jesus Christ, rode a colt, the foal of an ass. Wasn't tamed. That'd buck anyone off and run away. So these principles are, are all there, but they'll be magnified in the kingdom of God, brothers and sisters. Nebuchadnezzar saw the kingdoms of men in his dream as gold and shiny metals and, and glor glorified. Daniel saw the same dream and they were beasts. The nations are beasts. And yet in this day, in this age, they'll be tame. And this will be an age, brothers and sisters, where we will see the little child lead them. And uh, the wolf and the lamb will dwell together as well. They will not hurt nor destroy. And finally, long life in the, millennial, in the millennium for mortals. For the days of a tree, so shall my people be. And my chosen, my elect, shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Why are we looking at these things? We're looking at these things to encourage each other in the truth. We're looking at these things so that we can see ourselves there in that day and it can be real and we can speak to those around us and we can picture ourselves in that wonderful day that is soon to come. Thank you.